you that don't know me, my name is Brandon Keller. I'm the youth director here. Who here is happy to be on fall break? Awesome, awesome. Vacation is my favorite. Vacation is my favorite. So, like I said, welcome to 155. We're going to be doing a series tonight called Wise Up, which we've been doing for a couple weeks now. There was a bulletin in your seat when you sat down. There's a connection card there. Do your usual, fill that out with at least your name, your grade, your email, any comments on the back. There's some next steps we'll talk about in a little bit. So before we get started, I'm going to kind of recap what we've seen and heard so far the last couple weeks. So two weeks ago, Chandler kicked this whole thing off, and Chandler focused a lot on kind of this wise up challenge, which is reading the book of Proverbs, because there is a lot of wisdom and knowledge in Proverbs. So that was kind of something he got started on. He talked about the fact that wisdom is kind of a funny thing that wisdom isn't something you just get naturally. It's not something that you just, you know, it just shows up in your, in your being. It's something you have to pursue. So as you get older, you don't automatically get wiser. People always have this vision of somebody that's like Yoda, that's 900 years old, so therefore he's very wise. But when the fact is, Getting older doesn't make you automatically wiser. You have to seek out wisdom. And so one of the things Chandler said you could do is a good way to seek out some wisdom would be to read the book of Proverbs because there's 31 Proverbs. It's a great one a day. It literally takes like three to five minutes to read one chapter of Proverbs. So really, if you didn't know how to do anything else reading the Bible, you could just start reading Proverbs and everything would be fantastic. You could just read one a day get through it in a month, start over the next month, and just keep reading one a day, really, because there's so much good wisdom there. So he also talked about some cool sticky friendships and what that means. So if you guys didn't see Chandler, you can watch him on YouTube. Just go to either Twitter or Facebook, look for our YouTube link, and you can watch Chandler on YouTube from two weeks ago. Look for the Wise Up series. So last week, we had Chris and Stacia up here talking to us, and they had a little more detail on kind of what a good friendship looks like and how to have good friendships and what that looks like. And so one of the things they talked about was seeking wisdom comes from a choice of what kind of friends you actually have. It's really important what kind of friends you have. And Chris talked about there's this lie out there that you don't need any help when the truth is you really do need help and that is friendships and, and what that looks like. And so really last week was all about, you know, making good decisions around your friends, making sure you're identifying what kind of friends they are and, and really kind of, you know, being a better friend and what that looks like. Now, last week, one of the next steps, on, like on your connection card that we'll talk about in a little bit, was one of the actual next steps that Chris asked you to take was, I will be a better friend. I will be a better friend. The funny thing is, when I look through the connection cards, less than half of you check that box, which means either two things. One is you think you're already the best friend ever, and so there's no reason to get, become a better friend. You're like, I am the best friend already. There's nothing I could do that would make me a better friend to anybody. Or you just don't care about friendships, and therefore it's not important to you or, or whatever. So we kind of take some you know, feedback as you guys decide whether or not you're going to check any of those boxes for next steps. And so Realize that the reason you're here is to become a better person. So if you're not taking any next steps, you may be wasting some of your time because you're just standing still if you're not taking steps. So when we're asking about those next steps, if you're serious about moving forward in your life, make sure you're making those next steps. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit more in depth. So tonight's kind of the advanced lesson on friendship compared to the first two weeks. And so first we're going to talk about what is a true friend? What, what is a, does anybody here think they have a true friend? Like that person is like, this is definitely a true friend of mine. Okay, good. That's a lot of true friends. That's good. So let's look at what a true friendship would look like. So when I think of a true friend, this is kind of what I think of. I think of, it's like Friday night, you're getting ready to go to the football game and you're like, let's go to Pedro's. So you and your friend go to Pedro's and while you're at Pedro's, you get like that big, massive burrito that they have that's just like that massive burrito thing that like covers the whole plate and hangs off the side with queso all over it. 
and it's filled with like meat and beans and cheese and onions and hot sauce and usually a little bit of cilantro because they like cilantro and Mexican food. And you just eat that entire burrito. Anybody ever eaten one of those huge burritos at Pedro's? They're fantastic. So you eat that massive burrito and you're like, oh, warm burrito in my belly. And you're like, okay, let's go to the football game. And you kind of give your friend a smile like, hey, I'm ready to go. And they look at you and you have a big old piece of cilantro just stuck to your tooth. You ever notice how cilantro just like sticks to your teeth like glue? You have that big old piece of cilantro like stuck right there in your teeth. A true friend, this is what a true friend does. A true friend quietly says, um, Sammy, you have, a, you have a little bit right there in your teeth. You have a, you know, really quiet like. That's what a true friend does. It, it helps you out. A, a not true friend is like, ha ha, you have cilantro in your teeth. Like across the restaurant. Or better yet, lets you go to the football game and look like a fool all night with cilantro in your teeth, right? That is not a true friend. A true friend tells you you have cilantro in your teeth. So what else would a true friend do? Maybe a true friend would, you know, help you out because you walk out of the restroom at school and you have like those three squares of toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your shoe. And you're like tromping down the hallway with toilet paper stuck to your shoe. Anybody ever had that happen to them before? Toilet paper is very sticky for some reason. So it doesn't seem like toilet paper should be sticky because of what you use it for, but it is. So anyway... So a true friend would be like, stop, stop, you have toilet paper on your shoe, and they step on it for you so you can, like, go your way without toilet paper on your shoe. That's what a true friend would do. So real quick, I want you to turn to somebody next to you and, and tell them something else a true friend would do. Right now, hurry. What, what would a true friend do? What, what would a true friend, how would you consider somebody a true friend? What would they have to do? to be a true friend. A true friend, not, not something mean or sassy. Like, what would a true friend do? Are you guys ready? You got something? Okay, here we go. Kevin, what would a true friend do? What was that? They would say your scar is going to look nice. That is a true friend. You're right. They would say your scar is going to look nice. Rachel, what would a true friend do? A true friend would tell you if your outfit is ugly. Even if it's not, sometimes they might, right? That's, that's what true friends are for. All right, one more. What, what do you got way in the back there? What was that? If your hair looks bad, they tell you? You're right. That is what a true friend would do. I was talking the other night with uh, Chandler, and we were talking about friendship, and we decided one thing that a true friend does is puts up with the other friend's farts. That's, that's kind of what a true friend, it's like farts are funny, so everybody just kind of laughs about farts. So, all right. So, one of the things we talked about in the last couple of weeks is that a true friend will remove their mask and kind of show you the real them, right? I mean, you'll remove your mask and kind of show that person who you really are and not put on any, you know, fakeness with the whole thing. And that's really what friendship's about is, is not having any of those, those things that are going to kind of bind you up. Now, last week, Stacia referred to Proverbs 27.6. Does anybody remember besides Stacia what Proverbs 27.6 was? All right, I'll tell you. It's Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Now, I'm sure when you read that verse, all you focus on is kissing because you're a bunch of perverts, but it's not really, it's not really about kissing so much. It's, it's really about the wound part and the true friend. And what it's really saying is that, listen, shh. A true friend would shut up. Shh. Okay. <laughs> what it's really saying is that a true friend may say something to you that's really hard to hear because a sincere true friend may wound you with their words, but it's out of love that they're wounding you, not out, out of hate. So now when you read that verse, I want you to think about the fact that it's, it's out of love that they would wound you, not anything else. So the Bible is really good about kind of making mental pictures about things. And there's a lot of 
metaphors in the Bible. If you read through it, you're like, what are they talking about? Why are they talking about chickens and land and talents? And what, what is all these metaphors? And so what the verse we're going to work on tonight and really kind of talk about the whole basis of our friendships is Proverbs 27, 17. And it's up on the screen, and it's probably on your outline there, and it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So what that means is that a true friend will make you sharper. Sharper equals better. And, and you're going, okay, well, you know, what makes you think sharper is better? Well, back when they wrote this, you know, back in, in the days of Jesus and before Jesus, sharp things had a lot of value. And let me show you. So, so like this sword, this sword is, is reasonably sharp, right? So sharp swords have a lot more value than a non-sharp sword, right? If it's not sharp, it's more of just a club. You just kind of hit people with it. But if it's sharp, you can cut things with it, right? This is a pretty sharp sword, right? Looks good. So when you're thinking of how iron sharpens iron, because that's what they would use essentially another iron block to sharpen this, that's how a friend sharpens a friend. You have to think of the fact that you want it to be sharp because that's what's of value. So maybe what they're saying is, a friend that keeps you sharp is more valuable than a friend that doesn't keep you sharp, right? So nowadays, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about that sharp things, right? Because we, we don't need stuff like this to survive. There's no, you know, there's no reason to really carry a sword usually, although it's fun. I mean, I'm having fun just carrying it right now. But there's usually no need to carry a sword. But back in the days when they wrote this, this may protect you, right? This may save your life. This may be exactly what you need. Now, in the Bible, there's a story of Jesus, and Jesus is with all his friends, and the Pharisees are going to send people to capture Jesus. And so Jesus has all his buddies around, and, and here come the guards. They're going to capture Jesus because, you know, Jesus has supposedly done some wrong stuff. And so the guards come in to capture Jesus, and all of Jesus' friends kind of gather around him like, no, you're not going to take Jesus from us. And one of Jesus' friends jumps out with his sword, and what does he do? He slices a guy's ear off. That's right. One of the guards, he just runs up and just slices his ear off. Now, I don't know how sharp a sword has to be to just slice a guy's ear off. Jaden, can you come up here and we'll test it? Oh, okay. So... I don't know how sharp it has to be, but obviously if it's sharp enough to cut a guy's ear off, that makes it of a lot more value than if it's dull and it just kind of like bounces off the guy's head, right? It's like dong. Oh, that didn't work. Let me try again. But this was important because it had to save people's lives and try to protect people. So, but it's not very sharp. If it's not very sharp, it's not very valuable. So I'm going to put this down before I cut my own hand off. And it will not be available for show and tell later. So, yeah, I know, I know. All right, so a couple weeks ago, Chandler talked about friends and, and what some of those friends do. And what we found out is that some friends are really good about tearing you down, right? Some friends will just, that's just their natural thing. And I don't know if you've had one of those friends in your life. I know I've had a couple of them where you don't realize that we've even had a whole series about vampire friends that kind of just suck the life out of you and just kind of tear you down and just kind of pull you to a place you're not supposed to be. But that's not what this is about. Sharpening somebody isn't about tearing them down. It's about building them up and making them better by making them sharper. So do you guys think, that, okay, listen, sh so you guys have like an inner circle of friends, right? You, you have like a group of friends you kind of think of as your closest, you know, your fab five, if you had that cell phone plan, you know, kind of who your best friends are. I know Chris make, always makes a joke about the people he most texts in his, in his text line of, you know, who, who the top pe ranking people are. You know, if you think of who are the top people in your text messages, 
It's probably kind of your best friend group. Now think of it this way. Do you think everybody in your, in your best friend group can be a sharpening type of person? Probably not, right? It's, it's probably not realistic that everybody in that group is, is really a sharpening type of person. So what you needed to do, and this is number one on your outline there, is decide who's in your sharpening, sharpen circle. Decide who's in your sharpen circle. <laughs> so everybody in that circle is not going to be able to, Everybody in your close circle of friends isn't actually going to be somebody that can sharpen you, though, right? Because that's kind of a different set of, of things. And, and what, I like to re what I'd like you to realize is that a lot of times it may be a little bit of a one-way relationship on some of these, right? It could be that somebody's asked you to kind of help them and hold them accountable, so you're able to sharpen them, but maybe they're not able to sharpen you because... You, your relationship's still not working that way, or maybe they've asked you for accountability or something, and you're not ready for them to hold you accountable yet. So sometimes it can be a one-way relationship. But I would say there's probably a pretty good chance that the person that you need to have that sharpening relationship with is probably here in this room. And the reason I say that is because to have a good sharpening relationship and, and to really build yourself in the way you need to go and to be sharpened, that needs to be somebody that also has a relationship with God like you do because you guys have that in common and that needs to be the thing that you're both driving towards is, you know, how, how are we supposed to act per the Bible? So making sure that person's here. So they may be here in the room, maybe they're in your family group or maybe it's a, a close friend at school, but it's got to be somebody that has high moral character. You, you can't have somebody sharpen you that has no character and, 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 you know, is making bad decisions and all that because they're not going to sharpen you in the way that you deserve and need to be sharpened. And here's something to kind of think about is that kind of the, the practical thing of once you figure out who's in the sharpened circle, this person's going to really kind of do two things. First, they're going to call out the good. And that's on your outline, fill that in. Call out the good. I also like to say encouragement. This is kind of the encouragement phase of this whole thing. So call out the good slash encouragement. And I have to be honest, this is probably the hardest part of being a good sharpening friend to somebody. And this is why. And, and this is just from my own private personal thing is that if you have a friend that's super good at something, does anybody here have a friend that's like, super good at something, and you're like, wow, that person is so good at that, right? Like, you know, everybody has that friend. Like, you know, I have a good friend, Chris Woodson, who is world-class at burning popcorn. I mean, the guy is world-class, really good at it. But, but I also have friends that are also good at other things. Like, I have friends that are awesome at playing instruments. I have friends like Danny that are awesome singers. I have friends at work that are awesome motorcycle riders. I, I, I have friends that are, you know, fantastic in the gym and can do these amazing physical feats that I cannot do. And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times if you're trying to be one of these sharpening friends, and at least it happens for me, I can't speak for you, is that when I see somebody do something awesome like that, instead of encouraging them and going, man, that was awesome, you did such a good job, my first thought is, Man, I wish I was that good at that. I, I wish I could do that. I, I, they're so lucky. They can do that. I, I, I can't do that, right? That's my first thought every time is it's more envy. It's more about me, not about them. And so it's so hard a lot of times to call out the good in a friend because you're so worried about yourself. And I know because I'm talking to myself, it happens to me all the time. You have to be careful that when you're calling out the good, that you're doing it because they're good, not because you're trying to compare yourself to them. So maybe a friend gets an A on a test in math class and you did not. Is it hard to be like, hey, good job, that's so awesome, you did good, I did terrible, right? That, that's hard to do. Maybe, maybe your friend got nominated for a GHP and you didn't make it. And you're like, oh, you know, you, you want to be encouraging for him, you want to encourage him, you want to call out the good, that's so awesome, I'm so proud of you. But you're so mad that you didn't because, you know, you wanted to get 
you wanted to get nominated. So maybe your friend made the varsity team and, and you tried out also but didn't make it. It's so hard to be encouraging to a friend and sharpen them and, and make them feel good about themselves if you're kind of feeling bad for yourself. And so we have to be careful because that envy thing kind of happens to you. And, and like I said, I don't know if it's happened to any of you, but it's definitely happened to me. So watch out. It could happen to you. But it's so important that a good friend that's sharpening you and that you're sharpening them calls out the good through encouragement. And I would say that, you know, and, and that, you know, great job, way to go, all that. And a lot of times that may also mean maybe they didn't completely succeed. Maybe they didn't completely kill it, but it's something maybe you've seen them put a ton of effort into. It's like, man, I know you've been practicing the guitar for like two years, and, and I know it didn't go exactly the way you thought your first performance, but man, you did such a good job. I'm so proud of you. Keep trying. I know it's going to get better. That's what a true friend would do, right? Encourage them even through just some effort, not that they succeeded and did this great thing, but at least they tried. How do we be a good friend and just call out that great stuff. I remember about, I don't know, 15 years or so ago, I decided I needed to start working out because I'd never really worked out much a after high school and I was a little tiny scrawny guy, which still kind of am. And I decided I was gonna go work out and I had this good friend that had been working out for a long time. He was kind of a big guy or whatever. So we started going to the gym together. And the first time we lay down on the bench press, he throws like three wheels on each side, right? And just whoosh, starts just repping it out, just crushing it. I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting. So I'm like, well, let's try just 145 on each side. Because I think I used to be able to do that like when I was a senior. So that was 10 years ago. So let's, let's see what happens. So, you know, we put 135 on there. And I, I get like one or two out and just barely get it. And as I'm trying to get that last one, he's like encouraging me. Come on, man, you can do it. You can do it. Come on, you can do it, right? And he's encouraging me the whole way. And I finally get like three. And I, I have to quit. Whew. It's just like, he's like, dude, that was awesome. And he's like, you're going to do, you know, he's like, that's a great place to start, man. If you can start there, next time you can do five. Next time you'll do 10, you know. He was encouraging me, even though I felt so weak and inferior to what he was doing. If he wasn't a good sharpening friend, he would have been like, dude, you suck. It's like, <laughs> my mom could do that, right? I mean, he'd be like totally talking trash on me, but he wasn't. He was an encouraging, good, sharpening friend that was trying to talk me through, even though I wasn't doing great, I was at least putting in the effort and he recognized my effort. So be careful about, you know, when you're encouraging people to make sure that you're encouraging them even through effort, even if they didn't completely succeed. A lot of times people need to hear, hey, good job, I know you tried hard, because a lot of times that's the best you can do, right? So a sharpening friend will call out the good. So next one, this one's a little more challenging. A sharpening friend will also call out the not so good. Call out the not so good on your outline there. Now when I talk about this, I feel like this is something you kind of need to have um, a conversation with your friend before this part of your relationship kind of starts. You need to kind of have this known between each other and, and just, don't un, just don't think it's understood that we can do this. I think you almost need to have this conversation because this is where it can be a little bit difficult and it really needs to be kind of prearranged because like that verse we talked about, that wounds from a friend, that's really what this is about. So, and what this is about is that a sharpening friend won't let their friends settle for anything but the best. Your friends see the best in you. They know you are capable of so much and they will not let you lower the bar to kind of settle, right? They know you're capable of so much and they will just push you and push you through love to get to that bar and they will not let you settle to anything lower than that. And so what you need is somebody that's not willing to let you compromise what you're about. You know, if you have a goal, they're going to hold you to that goal and, and, and push you to that goal. And they're also going to call out things that maybe, maybe that's not the direction you should be going with your life. And maybe that's what they're going to call you out on. I happen to know that for some reason in middle school, uh, raise your hand if you're a middle schooler. See them. Awesome. A bunch of you tonight. All right. I happen to know in middle school 
this crazy thing starts to happen in middle school where just about everybody decides that cussing is the coolest thing on the planet. And they decide that they're going to say every word that they've ever heard because they're not at home. They're like, I'm going to test out every one of these words at middle school. And we're going to see how all these work. So like, you know, in the hallway, on the playground, in gym class, whatever. People are just knocking out every cuss word they've ever heard their parents say or not say because, you know, parents do cuss sometimes. Um, you know, they're just completely saying everything they say. But if you have a friend that's a sharpening friend that's going to call out the not so good, what they're going to say to you is, you know what? I don't think that's what you want to be with your life. I don't think you want to be a cusser. I, I notice you're cussing a lot when you're in middle school, you know, when you're in class. And it's funny, I don't see you cussing anywhere but at school. So I don't think you want to be a cusser, so why are you cussing? And that's maybe a hard conversation to have, right? Your friend's like kind of in your face, but that's what you need because that sharpens you and makes you better. Maybe, maybe you're in high school and now you're, all of a sudden you're gossiping a bunch or subtweeting the heck out of people, right? A, a true friend is going to go, I don't think that's what God has planned for you. I don't think, I don't think you, wa you want to be known as the huge gossip. So why are you gossiping? That's what a true friend that's calling out the not so good may do. But this is the important part of a true friend doing this. They do it privately. They don't blow you out at the lunch table and be like, I can't believe you said that, right? They're not doing that at the lunch table. They're not blowing you out on social media. They're privately pulling you aside and be like, I don't think that's what God has planned for your life. Why are you acting this way? Why are you doing that? Why are you making that bad decision? That's what a true friend that sharpens you would do if they're calling out the not so good in your life. But they have to do it privately because that's what's important about this because nobody likes to kind of be blown out in public. That's for sure. So on your connection card, there's a next step. We talked about next steps. This one is, you know, I want to find somebody that can help sharpen me. Um, so if that's something that you need, you, need you, you desire somebody to sharpen you, and maybe you don't have that friend in your life, maybe that's what you need to pray for is, God, give me something in my life that can hold me accountable and, 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 and you know, sharpen me and make me a better person, and, and I can have that relationship with them where they can call out the good and not so good because I need that person in my life. So maybe that's a great prayer for you to just continue to work on because you want somebody that will sharpen you because you want a sharpen friend. You don't want a sledgehammer friend. Has anybody had a sledgehammer friend? And that's the person that will pretty much just blow you out, right, on the lunch table, on Twitter, wherever, right? Because when a sledgehammer friend kind of corrects you, it doesn't feel very good, right? It, it, sometimes it feels like your parents correcting you or worse, right, because you're getting kind of humiliated at the same time you're being corrected. And that's not the type of correction you want. So you don't want a sledgehammer friend. You want a sharpening friend that's going to kind of keep you sharp. So another verse that's on your outline there is Ephesians 4.15. Everybody see that? And it says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who is head of his body, the church. So I want us to focus on the beginning there. It's instead we will speak the truth in love. That's what this whole thing's about. The difference between being a sharpening friend and maybe a sledgehammer friend is speaking the truth in love. That's the key. If you're going to be a sharpening friend to somebody, you need to do it out of love, not out of spite, not out of jealousy, not out of anything like that. You need to do it out of love. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the band to come up, and we're going to get ready to kind of wrap this thing up for tonight. So, but one more verse I wanted to kind of talk about before we wrap this thing up, and it kind of goes with this whole sharpening thing, and, and we're getting ready to kick off a, a big series downstairs, which is called pray, Prayer First. And so this kind of fits into this, and this is really about what I would call the biggest lie that Christians tell each other almost on a daily basis. The biggest lie that Christians constantly tell each other on a daily basis 
And, and, and it doesn't mean to be a lie, but it turns into one, which is this, this common four-word phrase of, I'll pray for you. Has anybody ever told you that? You're telling them everything that's going wrong. They're like, I'll pray for you, right? Unfortunately, and I've been guilty of this myself, we forget to pray for people. We, 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 we just don't do it. We tell them we will. We, we don't. But, you know, part of sharpening and helping with a friend is also praying for that friend through problems they're having. So when you tell somebody, hey, I'll pray for you, maybe you need to write that person's name on your bulletin tonight, or maybe you need to, you know, pull out your phone and be like, Siri, remind me to pray for Susie later, right? Whatever it takes, you know, to remember to do that because it's so important because the Bible says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So tonight, you only had two next steps on your bulletin. One we talked about, you want that friend that can help sharpen you. The other one is if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior tonight, all this is kind of probably going over your head because you're like, why do I need to be sharp? What, what, what is all this about sharpening? My life's going fine. I don't need all that. Once you start that relationship with Jesus, he changes your perspective of what's important in your life. And so if you don't have that on lock, you need to get that figured out tonight. And so when I pray right now, if, if, if you need to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life and and, and have him just help you through what's going on in your life, you can do that tonight. So let's bow our heads and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for tonight that we can come here and just talk openly about friendships and what that really means. How, how, do, we, how do we have good sharpening friends, God, and, and how can they help us through our life? God, I ask that these students tonight that are here, God, if any of them don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, that they tonight just admit that, they, they've messed up, they've sinned, and they just need you, God, to, to right their wrongs. Because, God, we know you died on the cross for us, and, and it's just such a big sacrifice you made, God. You're the ultimate sharpening friend. And, God, I just am so thankful for these students that are here tonight that are taking a next step and, and realizing that they need a friend to help sharpen them so they can get through life and improve and gain wisdom as they go through life, God, because that's what it's all about is getting smarter and better and wiser as we grow older because we don't want to make the same stupid mistakes over and over. God, thank you for this time that we can all be together. Bless this time. In your name we pray. Amen.